welcome to the SWS Natu Natu series and my name is Tejaswini Umasadhi. Today, we are going to be revising a very important chapter in physics in the run-up to the Physics Board Exam 2023 on March 17. So, we will be revising the chapter 4 in one shot so that any question that comes from this particular chapter, you will be able to score very easily and we are going to be revising it in one shot with all the important concepts and numericals that you need to know before your exam. Let us start. So first, let us talk about what is force. So force, when it is applied on a rigid body, it causes motion. When it is applied on a non-rigid body, it causes motion, of course. It also causes a change in the size and shape of the body. This is something basic which you have learned over the years. So now, how can we define force? Force is defined as a rate of change in linear momentum, right? So what we can do is that we can write it as force, which is a vector quantity, is equal to dp by dt which is nothing but momentum is nothing but mass into velocity so we can write is a rate of change of mass into velocity so d into mv by dt which is nothing but v by t velocity by time is nothing but acceleration so we can say that force is equal to mass into acceleration here that we are considering that mass is a constant so this is one of the first concepts you need to be knowing that force is nothing but mass into acceleration considering that mass is constant in this case. So the SI unit of force is Newton or kilogram force and it is a vector quantity, right? And uh, what we need to know here is that 1 kgf, which is kilogram force, is equal to gram into Newton if g is the acceleration due to gravity and g's value will be 9.8 meters per second square. One important thing which you need to be knowing in physics is that your units are very important. You can't just write 9.8. You need to write 9.8 meters per second square. If that is not there, you won't get your marks. So SI units are very important. So there are basically two kinds of motion. One is linear or translational motion and one is rotational motion. So what does linear or translational motion mean? What it means is that if there is a body, right? And there is a force applied to that particular body. Suppose say this is a ball and I am pushing it and it is moving in this direction. This is the direction of motion. So this is known as linear or translational motion, right? This is the most simple type of motion. Next is the rotational motion. Rotational motion basically means that if a body is pivoted at a point, for example, say this is a wheel, right? It is pivoted at a point and a force is applied here for instance so what happens this is a ball okay this is what happens is that it moves in this direction it moves it rotates and this is known as rotational motion the, uh, for example if a wheel is pivoted at the center and a force is applied tangentially then the wheel rotates about the center so this is known as rotational motion. These are, very, these are very, very basic things, right? So the most important thing which we are going to be focusing in this particular chapter is something called moment of force or torque, right? So what are the two factors which affect the moment of force? This can come as a two mark question. So the two factors affecting are magnitude of the force applied and distance of line of action of force from the axis of rotation, right? So this is the, the distance of line of action of force from the action, axis of rotation and the magnitude of the force applied. So the, this is a definition you need to be remembering well. So moment of force or torque is equal to the product, product of magnitude of force and the perpendicular distance of the line of action of force from the axis of rotation. Perpendicular distance of the line of action of force from the axis of rotation. So this is the most important keyword which you need to be remembering as far as moment of force is concerned. So what will be the, the formula is very simple. Moment of force, let's just write it as MOF, will be equal to force, which we are going to write as F, into perpendicular distance of the force from the point O, which is the pivot here. So, and suppose this is P. So F into OP, 
will be nothing but moment of force, right? So this is your most important definition, which is quite likely to come in your board examination. Now let us talk more about the unit of moment of force. So as we know, F into OP is nothing but moment of force. F or uh, F's unit is Newton and OP is in meters. So the SI unit will be SI unit will be Newton meter, which is given here, which is the SI unit. And in CGS unit, it is dying centimeter. And suppose gravitational force comes, comes into consideration that it is kgf into meter or it is gf into centimeter. So what is the relation between these units? So what it says is that one newton meter is equal to 10 to the power of 5 dyne into 10 to the, into 10 to the power of 2 centimeter. So as we very well know, 100 centimeters make a meter and 10 to the power of 5 dynes make 1 newton. Right, you need to be remembering this. So what this comes to is 10 to the power of 7 dyne, dyne centimeter, right? And we also know that 1 kgf meter is equal to 9.8 newton meter and 1 gf centimeter is equal to 980 dyne centimeter right this is very simple so this is something these are some of the relations you need to be keeping in mind while you are solving there may be a simple question based on just converting from say newton meter to gf centimeter these basic conversions you need to be keeping in mind now the next concept that we come to is anti-clockwise movement and clockwise movement so when a rotation takes place uh, it either you either move like this or you move like this, right? So you either move anti-clockwise or clockwise. Suppose a force is uh, suppose this is a ball and force is applied here, it will move like this. Or if a force is applied here, it may move like this. So if you are having anti-clockwise movement, it we are considering it positive or outward direction. And if it is clockwise movement, we are considering it negative or inward direction. This is something you need to be um, remembering because you will be actually using this in your um, problems, right? And um, what we say is that you can um, change this direction by either changing the uh, point of application of force, that is where you are applying the force, or you can change the direction of the force. You, I can either move it in this uh, direction, can be this direction, can be this, or direction can be this, or the place where the force is being applied. These are the two ways of actually changing the moment, the direction of moment of force. So, what are the examples of moment of force? Opening and shutting of a door. You are opening a door. Each door has a hinge, right? So, um, suppose you are trying to open the door from the hinge. It is very difficult to open the door. Or if you are uh, applying force at a point which is close to the hinge of the door, it is difficult to actually open the door. While if you, the, the reason why hand, so a easy give reason can, be come, can come based on any of the examples of the moment of force. So, they can ask why is, why do they place the handle of a door at the corner and not near the hinge of the door? That is because as the perpendicular distance increases, the amount of force applied is decreases and therefore it is easier to open the door. You cannot open the door if the handle is at the hinge because then the torque will be equal. The distance, perpendicular distance is zero because of which the torque will be zero. That is one thing. Another uh, example can be that of a hand floor grinder, right? So the hand floor uh, grinder also, the... Um, handle is always placed at the rim it is not placed at the center so that it is easier for us to actually grind turning over steering wheel turning over steering wheel is an epic example of how when you are using you tangentially apply the force along the rim of the wheel so that it is easier to actually turn turning of a tooth wheel of a bicycle is another example and also a spanner right spanner has a handle the longer the handle it is easier to actually apply the force uh, less force needs to be applied and can easily be used to actually open the screw or any of the uses of a spanner, right? So, moment of force examples is something based on which give reasons can be asked. So, please look at 
it's very easy. It's the same concept which you need to be applying in each of these cases about force, about the distance between the application of force and the pivot point and how um, all of us want to make less effort and easier the work is done. So this is the basic concept that needs to be taken care of. Next, let's talk about couple, right? So um, rotation, when, a, when rotation is produced in a particular body, it is always due to a pair of forces. So one is the externally applied force, that is the force which I am applying, and the reaction force. And these two are actually opposite in direction. So the definition of, they may ask you the definition of a couple, which can be for a two-mark question. So what it says is that two equal and opposite fo parallel forces not acting along the same line form a couple, right? So couple is nothing but two equal and opposite parallel forces not acting along the same line. So for example, this can again be one place where Ghibli's and Saras, for example, turning a water tap. So while I am turning a water tap, tight, uh, or a tightening of an ink cap, or turning a lock in a key, I am applying a force. On the other side, an opposite force is being applied in the opposite direction because of which the rotation is actually taking place. So rotation is always, this can be an MCQ that can be our rotation is produced due to one external force, internal force, two forces. The answer would be because of a pair of forces is the give is the right answer, right? So next, let's go to the next concept, which is movement of a couple. So movement of a couple would be either force into couple arm. So what do we mean by couple arm? Couple arm is basically the distance between the force applied and the pivot. It's actually the perpendicular distance, nothing but the perpendicular distance. It's called the couple arm because it's actually the distance between the reaction force and the externally, externally, apply, externally applied force and the reaction force. And uh, movement of couple is either force. Either force, why is it given? Because uh, both the forces are actually equal, right? So whether you consider the externally applied force or the reaction force, they're actually equal in magnitude. So it's either force into couple arm. is nothing but the movement of the couple. Now it is very important that whatever body is in equilibrium. So when do we say equilibrium, the name itself suggests that equilibrium of bodies basically means that the resultant of all forces is equal to zero. And the algebraic sum, algebraic sum is very important. Algebraic sum means that the positives and negatives are taken into consideration. That is, as you can recall, anti-clockwise uh, boleto positive or clockwise boleto negative. So all that algebraic sum means all that um, uh, uh, sim, uh, pluses and minuses are considered. And algebraic sum of movements of all the forces about the fixed point is zero. So if that entire thing comes to zero, that is sum of the anti-clockwise and clockwise movements is zero. And the resultant of all the forces, that is F1 plus F2 plus F3, everything is equal to zero. <coughs> then it is said that the bodies are in equilibrium. So the definition would say that when a number of forces acting on a body produce no change in its state of rest or state of linear or rotational motion, then the body is said to be in equilibrium. This is the definition you need to be remembering, right? And uh, there are two types of equilibrium. One is static equilibrium, one is dynamic equilibrium. So let me give you an example. Static equilibrium can be as simple as a book. I'm going to write it's a book and it's placed on a table. A book placed on a table is considered to be in um, static equilibrium because um, no force, that is, the book is exerting force on the table. A table is exerting an equal and opposite force on the book. But they're equal in magnitude and they're causing no change in the state of rest. So this is known as static equilibrium. Then an example of a dynamic equilibrium can be that of a raindrop. That is a raindrop which is um, coming on the earth's surface with a constant velocity. The weight of the falling drop is balanced by the sum of the buoyant force and the force due to friction. Uh, so the net force is uh, zero, so it goes with a constant velocity. So this is nothing but dynamic equilibrium. So an aeroplane moving at a constant height would also be an example of dynamic equilibrium because the weight of the aeroplane and the forces that are keeping it up, upward lift is known as dynamic equilibrium, right? So now let us go to our next concept, 
which is the principle of movements, which is basically um, as we must have. Uh, I remember when I used to go to um, the sabji market, right? So it is. It used to be very interesting to actually see a beam balance and how it is balanced, right? The weights here, um, according to what weight is placed here, they used to keep um, the item you're buying and they should be in equilibrium. If they are equilibrium, that means that you have bought those many grams or kgs of items and we, yeah, accordingly you are priced, right? So this is based on the principle of movements. So what it says is that the sum of anti-clockwise movements is equal to the sum of clockwise movements. What does that mean? Suppose this is the beam balance. Suppose there is weight placed here. So, excuse me, I'm having a very bad cold and cough. Uh, suppose you have weight here. It will move in this direction, which for me is the anti-clockwise direction. Weights here would be in the clockwise direction. If these two movements are equal, it is said to be, this is known as the principle of movements, right? This is very important. Most of the numericals are based on this. There are some things you need to be keeping in uh, 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 consideration while you are solving numericals based on principle of movements, which I'll be doing with the help of a question. So let us look at the question given. Right? A uniform meter rule exists horizontally on a knife edge at the 60 centimeter mark when a mass of 10 grams is suspended from one end. At which end must this mass be suspended? <coughs> What is the mass of the rule? Explain with the help of a diagram. Whether they say it or not, you have to draw a diagram if you really want to understand. Right? So they're talking about a meter rule. Meter rule means 100 centimeters, right? So let us say zero. And this is your 100 centimeter mark. This is your meter rule. It's called a uniform meter rule. What a uniform meter rule means is that um, the center of gravity, uh, let, we can consider that there is the middle of the rod will be the place where the, you can consider the mass of the rule. So this is your 50 centimeter mark. And here I say, this is where is the, let's consider the mass of the scale as M, M grams, right? And uh, the it's uh, as horizontally suspended on a knife edge at the 60 centimeter. So 60 centimeter pe ek knife edge. Hai. Let us represent it as this, right? So, um, Without uh, 10 grams being suspended itself, uh, when uh, the mass of the rule is at the 50 centimeter mark and the knife edge is at the 60 centimeter mark, it actually moves in this direction, which is the anti-clockwise direction. So therefore, to balance that, you need to have a, uh, a weight which is in the clockwise direction. So we, uh, uh, from one end is what it is written, the 10 grams. So it has to be from this end. So we'll consider that the mass is at the 10 grams at the 100 centimeter mark. So this is your diagram. This is uh, this is a very simple, di simple diagram which you need to draw. So next, let us go to the next slide. Um, so what you need to do is that um, sum of anti-clockwise movements is equal to sum of clockwise movements. Sum of anti-clockwise movements would be the mass of the scale, which is m, into the distance between the knife edge and that particular point, which is um, 60 minus 50, which would be equal to sum of the clockwise movements. The weight at uh, which was hanging from the end was 10 grams into the distance between the knife edge and that particular uh, place was 100 minus 60, right? Which you will get as m into 10 will be equal to 10 into 40, right? So uh, when you do this, you get that M is equal to 40 grams. So this is your answer. What did they ask you for? Let us go back to the question and check. Uh, they're asking at what end must be, that must be suspended. We got the answer that the mass must be suspended at the right end. That is at the 100 centimeter mark. And we have shown this as part of the diagram as well. What is the mass of the rule? That they are asking the value of m. m is equal to how much? And we found out that m will be equal to 40 grams. That is your answer. So what are the things you need to be remembering while you're solving any question in um in um some of uh, moment, uh, mo moments of force problems? One, you need to be knowing that if they have said that the mass is uniform, it will be from the center uh, play, point of center of gravity. 
Second point will be that uh, we need to always remember this particular formula sum of anti clockwise moments equal to sum of clockwise moments. They are very simple numericals. Ask always draw the diagram. The moment you draw the diagram, things will become very easy for you. They may ask you questions based on seesaw, based on um, weights like this. So, basic thing you need to keep into consideration. And also, most important, always have your units. You, are, you can't just write m is equal to 40. They will cut marks. You need to always be writing 40 grams, right? Let us go to the next concept. So basically, this entire chapter is actually divided into three parts. One is uh, moments of force. Second one is center of gravity. And third is circular motion. So the next one, next concept is nothing but center of gravity, right? So the center of gravity uh, basically says, uh, that gravitational force, as we all know, is attractive in nature, right? Um, so every particle is attracted towards the center of gravity, uh, center, and uh, a body uh, can actually be considered to be uh, made of several particles. And suppose this is our body, right? If suppose this is our body, and we can say that it is made of several particles like this, and uh, W1, W2, everything is, each of these particles are actually attracted towards the center, right? And um, what is the concept says that the center of gravity of a body is a point about which the algebraic sum of the moments of phase of all the particles constituting the body is zero. So center of gravity of a body basically is trying to find that particular point where the algebraic sum of the moments of weights of all the particles is zero. So the entire weight of the body can be considered to act at this point, howsoever the body is placed. So as we knew in the previous question, we considered that at the middle of the meter rule is the place where the entire weight of the body is actually acting. So this is actually known as the center of gravity. So um, it depends on the shape and the distribution of the uh, mass of the particles. And uh, one important concept is that it does not need to be within the material of the body. Right, it doesn't need to be that the center of gravity both jagger pe actually material ho. It can be is this uh, one of some of the tricky questions that may be asked. This can become so. Please remember this that it doesn't need to be that the material um of the body needs to be at the place where the center of gravity exists. Right, so um this is one of the tables which you need to be keeping in mind because questions can come based on this. <coughs> this particular thing, right? So as we know that if there is a rod, it at the center middle point of the rod is where the center of gravity exists. Uh, for a circular disc, it is at the geometric center. Um, for a circular ring, for a circular disc, right? And um, for a triangular lamina also, it is at the center of uh, intersection of the medium medians that the center of gravity exists. Then for a rectangle, it's for at the intersection of the diagonals. Then for the parallelogram also, it is at the intersection of the diagonals. For a square also, it uh, is the same thing. And uh, for a cylinder, it is um, uh, at the midpoint of the axis of the cylinder so for example this is a cylinder let us consider this is your axis at this point is the center of gravity so irrespective of whether it is hollow or solid whether the material is present or not these are the centers of gravity this is the particular table you please need to keep in mind because questions can come based on this right let us go to our next concept uh, so basically center of gravity ke basis pe numericals kuch aane ke chances nahi hai. it's basically lot of theory which you need to be keeping in mind. It's a very, very small concept which you need to know. Now we come to the next part which is uniform circular motion. So when a particular particle moves with a constant speed in a circular path. So what we need to know is constant speed in a circular path. It is known as uniform circular motion. Non-uniform velocity accelerated motion. Direction along tangent right at the point. So what, I'm, what do I mean to say? So there is a particle. There is a circular path. It is moving along the circular path. Speed and velocity. Velocity by direction is taken into consider consideration. 
यूनिफॉर्म स्पीड कॉन्स्टेंट स्पीड से मूव कर रहा है बट वेलॉसिटी चेंजेस इट इज नॉट यूनिफॉर्म वेलॉसिटी बिकॉज द डायरेक्शन इज चेंजिंग एट एवरी पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट बिकॉज द it is a circular path even if it is at the same speed the direction is changing because if it is non uniform velocity so therefore it is known as accelerated motion right and um, every time if you want to know uh, at this particular point uh, the direction is along the tangent if you want to know at this particular point the direction is along this particular tangent the direction of the particle is changes every particular point right so what so one important thing which you need to come No, is the difference between uniform linear and uniform circular motion? This is the question which has come in your previous board papers. So, what does uniform linear motion mean? Ah, uh, in uniform linear motion, um, constant um speed and velocity. Constant speed, constant velocity. If it is constant velocity, it means that um. Acceleration is equal to zero. When when it is uniform circular motion, speed is constant, but your velocity changes, right? So acceleration is equal to some particular value. Acceleration um the unit is meters per second square, right? So this is uniform linear and uniform um circular motion. uh this is very important next let's come to one of the most important uh, concepts in this particular part of the chapter which is centripetal and centrifugal force centripetal force is nothing but a motion uh, the force due to which motion in a circular path is made possible is known as centripetal force and this force is actually directed towards center so um if i have to show you if this is a particular uh, circular path and um Say A, B, C, D, and the force, uh, which is making the particle move in the circular path directed towards the center at every point of time, is known as centripetal force. <coughs> so, uh, as examples of uh, objects um using centripetal force, you can give the example of an electron moving along around the nucleus, or you can give the example of our own Earth, a planet moving around the sun. Or the moon revolving around the, um, uh, the moon around the uh, Earth, or it can be of a stone tied to a particular string, which is rotated, right? So all these are examples of centripetal force, and the, there's a particular force. It's a very real force. So one important thing it is that it is real force, which is uh, directed towards the center. What is centrifugal force? Centrifugal force is a force. Acting away from the center of the circular path, that is, the direction is like that, like outside, right? And what you need to be keeping in mind, which is a tricky thing, is that it is not a real force, and it is not a force of reaction. Just because centripetal has to use opposite centrifugal, नहीं होता है. This is an imaginary force that we actually imagine. So what you can um um give us an example um. To explain a uh, centrifugal force in your uh, but uh, in your examination can be that of a merry-go-round, right? So when you are inside the merry-go-round, you experience a particular type of force which keeps you um around, and when you are outside, it can actually the uh, the it's almost like an illusion, right? So uh one question which comes very often in examination is the uh give me two differences between centripetal and centrifugal force. so what we will say is that one is a real force one is a real force one is an imaginary force one is directed towards directed towards the center directed away from the center these can be the two differences and the third one you can give example for centripetal and centrifugal force right real and imaginary directed towards the center directed away from the center electrons planets moon stone very good one these are the three differences which you can state this is the last concept which you need to be keeping in mind in this particular force chapter so the numericals which comes um numericals which comes um from this particular chapter is basically in the first part which is the direct movement of uh, uh, first part which is directly the movement of force applications 
just go through all the questions, the example questions and the questions in your textbook. If you have any doubts, do write in the comment section. This is one of the most easy parts which you can um, easily score in this numerical section. Another thing which comes is give reasons. Give reasons, right? Which can again come based on part one, which can be about how... Um, uh, where a handle of a door is placed or how you are actually being able to move a steering wheel or the same book, simple give reasons can come. Um, or they may ask you simple two mark questions based on centripetal centrifugal force. Uh, they may not directly ask you, they may give you an example and say what type of force is actually being exhibited here. Or they may ask you um, center of gravity um, based questions that where the center of gravity of this particular um, item exists. Right. So this is a very simple and scoring chapter. Let me know if you want me to actually revise more chapters in the comment section and I'll gladly do so. Do support and subscribe to Study with Sudhir YouTube channel to get all the necessary information and to help you actually. The, mo the motive of our channel is that you actually ace your board exams and get a hundred on hundred. Right in um, the subjects. Um, physics can be tricky. Um, all you need to know, do is have a peaceful frame of mind while you are solving the questions and you'll be able to ace it. If you have any doubts, do write in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching.